how can a very peaceful area suddenly become the war zone. Hi, I'm Hiba Ali and welcome to Level 3, Stories from the Heart of Humanitarian Crises. I run IRIN, a nonprofit newsroom based here in Geneva that reports on conflicts and natural disasters around the world, as well as the multi-billion dollar industry that has spawned to respond to them. In each episode, we'll give you an inside look at the coverage from our newsroom, both here in the Aid Policy Hub of Geneva and from our 200 correspondents in hotspots around the world. If you want to better understand humanitarian crises, how they shape our world and what can be done about them, this is the podcast for you, my friends. We've called it Level 3 because that's the terminology the United Nations uses to designate the most severe humanitarian crises, places like Syria and Yemen, where millions of people are in need of help. In this episode, we'll speak to Emmanuel Freudenthal, the first journalist to report from within a separatist militia in Cameroon. And he's going to explain why the dream of an independent country called Ambazonia has turned farmers into fighters and displaced more than 180,000 people. But first, Erin's senior editor for policy, Ben Parker, joins us for a look at what's going on in our own backyard. Geneva is this home of international decision making on peace building, development, crisis response. We've got the UN headquarters just up the street from us. There are 32,000 people in this town working for more than 500 international NGOs, UN agencies, diplomatic missions, civil society organizations. The list goes on and on. Ben, welcome. Thank you. What is on your radar? A good one was that Syria is in charge of disarmament. He doesn't mean good one, surely. A bad one. Uh, uh, Yes, the uh, Syrian Arab Republic, due to the sequence of the alphabet, apparently, is the president of the UN's Conference on Disarmament, which is a little known um, and phlegmatic body that only gets interesting when things get messy. So um, the Conference on Disarmament uh, on its agenda this year has to consider the use of chemical weapons by the Syrian Arab Republic. So there was a stormy session where The American ambassador walked out, the president had to step aside and say, I'm talking on behalf of Syria, and now I'm talking on behalf of the president. Um, Syria tried to tell off the United Kingdom for calling it Syria and not the Syrian Arab Republic, and the whole thing was a preposterous bit of uh, diplomatic pantomime um, with a painful and horrific truth at the core. But I'm not really sure what the alternative is, because if you just skip Syria and they're not part of the debate at all, that doesn't help much either. They can be part of the debate, but they could, for for example, have stepped aside and said, we're a bit busy. We could pass it on to a country beginning with T. They chose not to because the more legitimacy that they have in the more bodies and international fora that they can parade themselves in, the happier they are. I don't know. I think you either accept that the United Nations is made up of all the countries of the world and they're all part of this structure or you don't. And it seems that here in Geneva, we're always halfway between the two. But well, interestingly, they didn't go to work. They didn't. It wasn't whitewashed. Syria was roundly condemned by most of the nations you would expect to condemn it, and somewhat defended by some of the others, like Venezuela and Cuba and China and others, who, you know, asked the rest of the group to back off a little. So, you know, the system functioned. It's just one of those very awkward mismatches. On Yemen, um, there's a lot of concern that the next stage in the ground war will involve the recapture of the northern port of Hodeida from rebel forces and this will um, be generally a a, a huge problem for commercial and humanitarian trade and cargo. Um, The Saudi-led coalition with some justification say you know they need to do what they need to do to dislodge an unsavory rebel group And the international community and the humanitarian side is very much unified in in telling them they really shouldn't because of the costs uh, to the local people and the impact it could have on port traffic. You've got to say at some point, you know, war, you know, the the, the aid agencies are not, it's not their business to stop war, really. And um, although it's not the received wisdom, um, I don't remember the aid agencies putting their hands up in the air when 
al-Shabaab was kicked out of the southern port of Somalia, or I'm not sure there aren't some double standards here. I do think there are logistical repercussions, and the Saudis and the Emiratis have not shown themselves brilliantly conscious of, of humanitarian principles. So, Nor for that matter, some of the Western countries supporting them. And indeed. And so um, I think I think there are, it is an interesting case where the, it's, it's, the lineup is very predictable, but I'm not sure the principles are quite where everybody says they are. We will follow that closely and report back in the next episode. At IRN, we often report on the places that are overlooked by mainstream media until they break out into catastrophe and become major headlines. And one of the stories that isn't yet a major headline, but may soon well be, is Cameroon. Tensions between Anglophone separatist groups and the Cameroonian state have simmered for more than a century, but they now seem set to boil over and are likely to upend plenty of lives in the process. Iron contributor Emmanuel Freudenthal has worked in East, West and Central Africa for the past decade. And in late May, he visited Cameroon for us, becoming the first journalist to embed with separatist fighters. Emmanuel, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So your story on the re-emerging conflict in Cameroon was one of our most read of the year. And suddenly it feels like the world is a bit more interested in the story. Amnesty International recently published a report on this and some mainstream media are now following your lead in, in trying to get into the country and cover this. Why does the story matter to you? I mean, you were literally walking into an active combat zone. So what propelled you to cover this story? So uh, the first time I went to Cameroon was uh, about 10 years ago. So it's a country I have uh, very strong connections with. I also lived there for a while. And uh, obviously, this conflict was the biggest thing that's happening right now in Cameroon. And it has a lot of uh, impact on Cameroon and on its future, uh, including the elections uh, later this year. So I wanted to see what's happening in those regions where I spent a substantial amount of time. How can... Um, very peaceful area suddenly become, you know, uh, like you said, a war zone. I, haven't, I hadn't known it like that. And how did it become a war zone? I mean, this Ambazonia place, what, what is it? Why are people giving up their lives for it? So in 1916, basically, uh, Cameroon used to be a, a colony of Germany. And after the end of the First World War, the country was um, split as a protectorate between France and the UK. So part of Cameroon started to speak English and then the other part started speaking French, uh, mostly. That's uh, at least a language that was uh, taught at school. Fast forward to the 1960s, Cameroon and, the, and Nigeria got their independence. The idea was to have two uh, official languages and uh, that, that's what happened. And then slowly, uh, a lot of Anglophone Cameroonians felt like the French uh, language was being imposed on them. There were more and more uh, protests and, and calls for greater autonomy of the Anglophone side of Cameroon and also better recognition of the English language, basically. And, and a couple of years ago, in two, uh, 2016, the process escalated and then they escalated even more last year in October until um, uh, the army basically killed protesters and jailed hundreds of people. That's what uh, led to a bunch of armed groups getting created in the Anglophone area of Cameroon seeking uh, independence. And so basically what had been a bit of a fringe idea, uh, at least a, a lot of people are, will argue that this is a fringe idea, um, to have a separate country became basically the norm. But you, you got pretty amazing access to these newly created militia groups. What was it like being in the bush with these guys? I mean, what were they like? So um, what was it like on a kind of daily basis was a, a lot of walking. Uh, a lot of these guys are uh, used to be farmers until the army quite often uh, uh, came and invaded the village and then they had to flee. And so then they joined this, uh, this militia, the Ambazonia Defense Forces. But apart from, you know, obviously the... <laughs> The, the attacks and the weapons and the ammunition. Um, this was like quite not entirely different from life in, a, in just an average village in, in Cameroon. Because you, you described them in the story as wearing flip flops and having hunting rifles. Like it seemed like a bit of an amateur operation or at the very least a bit, a bit surreal. 
Oh yeah, it's a totally an amateur operation. I mean, none of the people that I've met had uh, what you could call really a military background. Uh, most of them were farmers or maybe some people that were in business or, or some more fixed jobs. But the vast majority of them were farmers. Uh, obviously, not all of them had flip-flops. Some of them had better shoes. Um, there is a few that might have had machine guns, but I didn't see very many. Most of them had this, you know, old hunting rifles that were handed down by their fathers. And what did they tell you about what they wanted or, or what they were hoping for as a result of all of this? All of them want the restoration, as they say, um, of, a, of a country called Ambazonia. They want independence from Cameroon. And that's because they felt marginalized for so long. And, and the fact that the army invaded their villages and killed people is, is pretty much the last drop for them. All we need is just our land so that we can continue with our activities. Our children go back to school. we we'll continue with our work. So we cannot just stand and watch them killing our people, killing our women, raping them. We don't know where we can go to ask for help. So we are hiding inside the forest because, they, because of the soldiers. So we don't have anything and really we have to fight back. So Emmanuel, that's kind of representative of, of the situation for many of the fighters you met? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, they feel like they have their back against the wall and, and also the, another well, a key part of the reason they're fighting is because on top of the language discrimination, they also feel like the state is not delivering what a state should deliver um, in 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 well, pretty much in any country. There's very few roads in in these regions. Uh, the schools are sometimes in some tiny shack. They struggle to find teachers. There's no good health services. The fact that there are refugees in Nigeria means that this conflict has displaced people, um, both. I think people who who fled into Nigeria, but also even within Cameroon, people who are displaced. How are those people faring? Many people have been displaced. Over 180,000 people have been displaced. Some of them crossed the border to Nigeria. Those people are not faring well. They're struggling to have food. Many of those people are in the bush, usually sometimes uh, where their farms were. And those people, for example, who are in Nigeria, they're really struggling. There's uh, very little support for them. They barely have a place to sleep that's uh, not in the open. They were telling me that every night they have to find someone's porch to sleep on. They have this tiny room. Basically, that might be uh, six by six meters where all the women sleep. And it's, I don't know how they manage that because there's so many of them. They say there are 350. I mean, people were complaining about, you know, lack of education, lack of healthcare, and so on. But it was an area where there wasn't a lack of food. A lot of people were farmers. So now it's starting to be an issue, especially for those who had to move quite far away from where they were. They now depend on, on strangers uh, to give them food or give them work. When I interrogated them on why they left was the army came, they started shooting, they randomly killed people. They might have burned some houses or destroyed stuff and they looted, took the mattresses, took things away. And in a few villages, I know that if people come back, they'll get shot. I've heard several stories of the army establishing a camp in a village and if they see anyone walking there, they'll, uh, they'll shoot that person. And to, to what extent, I mean, you, you talk in the piece about meeting these displaced communities who hadn't come across any aid groups or hadn't had any kind of outside assistance. To what extent do you think this conflict is um, getting attention and engagement from the international community? I think it's uh, getting a, an increasing amount of attention. The UNHCR is tallying the number of refugees every few months and adding up how much it would cost to take care of them. And there's been discussions about it at the UN that are as far as I heard. So it is getting more and more attention. What do you think needs to happen now? 
Now, probably uh, the only way out would be uh, a negotiation, as I see it, uh, between the armed groups and the government. The problem is the uh, armed groups don't see the government as legitimate uh, because it is a, a dictature and uh, they want separation, whereas the government um, doesn't really want to negotiate with, with armed groups. And they said that the uh, unity of Cameroon is, is not up for negotiation. So it's a bit of a stalemate. Um, and, and right now, the biggest losers are uh, probably the civilians. As is always the case, sadly, in, in many of the stories we cover. Emmanuel, thank you so much for your reporting on this uh, issue. Really incredible story, which you can check out on our website at irannews.org. So, Ben, you've been listening in. What do you think? It reminds me of a, a number of times where a small, obscure, somewhat hard-to-understand squabble in a faraway place turns into something big. If you look at the beginning of the conflict in Darfur or the beginning of the conflict in the Eastern Democratic Congo, they were disputes about language, identity, representation, respect in a way and very easily overlooked, very easily you know, dismissed as a sort of back of beyond squabble. But look at us now, we're still, we're still dealing with the fallout in Congo. Mm. We're still, Darfur is in fact still burning, but nobody really talks about it. So yeah, it, it reminds me of other conflicts where they start small and, and if you don't you know, get a grip, there's always poisonous influences who will pour, pour you know, fuel on the fire. Mm. And from what, what's your sense of the degree to which people here in Geneva are talking about this or to the degree to which this could blow up into a, a DRC or a Darfur? Are people worried about that here? I tell you, the, the agenda is very full mm. for the international diplomats and the aid community. I went to a number of briefings and, and press encounters and press conferences and no, this didn't come up. This didn't come up. There was... Um, it was the boat in the Mediterranean, there was the assault on the port in Yemen, threatening to cut off half the country from food and fuel. Um, there's continuing diplomatic shenanigans on Syria. So no, Cameroon uh, hasn't been um, picking up, although the humanitarian side of the internationals here do try and remind us about the Lake Chad Basin, which is a rather complicated way of saying where Nigeria and Chad and Cameroon meet and with Niger. They also raised the alarm about Sahel, which is just a little bit across there in West Africa. But these places are always sort of a, a little sad, little flag is, is waved. Um, but, but the journalists are, are, are stampeding off to some other thing, which is much more prominent. So these dreams of an independent Ambazonia, will they ever get traction here? Well, ask the people in Somaliland who've been waiting 20, 30 years to be recognized as an independent state. There is no appetite, really, either in the African uh, diplomatic circles or more widely to create new states, um, even though the post-colonial borders are often nonsense. Um, so, yeah, it would be a, a very, very unlikely that they'd pick up support for an independent state. It's more likely that they could get some traction in power sharing um, and the president of, of Cameroon is, you know, one of the longest standing, least democratic figures in the continent. They will get some sympathetic hearing for that. But if you, if, if you do want to make waves in the international community, you need some other dimension. You know, Congo has these minerals that are very important for mobile phones. Other places have oil. You know, then you do get listened to if you can cause trouble in, on a wider stage. And I, I, I'm not aware of what, you know, in, in that part of Cameroon actually could bother people so that they sit up and pay attention. Thanks, Ben, for that sobering analysis. We'll continue following developments in Cameroon. But in the meantime, we'd like to leave you on a slightly more optimistic note. In each episode of Level 3, we'll end with voices from the world that we report on. And today, we'd like to introduce you to Ria William Uyeda, a former refugee who returned to her native South Sudan and founded an organization to empower girls and women. She spoke at the first ever TEDx talk recorded in a refugee camp, which was held last month at the Kukuma camp in Kenya. And I watched part of this TEDx because despite some legitimate criticism, 
I thought the concept went some ways to humanizing refugees. Ria spoke of bringing peace to her country just weeks before yet another ceasefire was signed and then quickly violated in an effort to end the five-year civil war. You can read more about the conflict in South Sudan on irannews.org, and you can hear more from Ria and the other TEDx speakers on the YouTube channel of the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR. Thank you for joining us in this first episode of Level 3, Stories from the Heart of Humanitarian Crises. We will refine this podcast with every episode, so please do be in touch with your feedback. Send us an email at hello at irannews.org, or find us on Twitter and Facebook at irannews. In the meantime, here's Ria from South Sudan. We want more women at the table. We are fighting without guns and through nonviolence to heal our war-torn country. And I believe with all my heart that the work we are doing will not only break the cycle of war, but it will help us unlearn the decades of violence and we will change the story of South Sudan.